the objective of this lecture today is to um, give you some flavor on uh, a few selected topics in uh, uh, and recent advancements um, in active research areas in computer vision and deep learning. So uh, we will uh, talk about uh, a few selected topics that cover uh, another form of uh, self of uh, learning called self-supervised learning, and we will see why this is uh, an important area and why it has emerged. Uh, then we will briefly talk about a new idea in deep learning uh, that is called capsule networks. Um, and importantly, then we will also touch a bit on um, how we can model uncertainty when we have uh, deep learning, but also um, you know, machine learning in general, so that we can provide a model with the ability to be able to figure out, OK, um, uh, this, uh, this prediction, I'm not confident about that. And basically, to make the model understand a bit what it knows and what it doesn't know. Uh, finally, we'll talk a bit more on uh, some practical aspects that relate to uh, some efforts to automate the process of building deep learning models. And then I uh, would we'll finish by talking a bit about the underlying hardware that we use to run these deep learning models. And um, just to understand um, why do we need uh, specialized hardware and what is this hardware exactly? So uh, we have seen uh, up to this point how deep learning and convolutional uh, neural networks have facilitated a lot of improvements in how we do uh, computer vision. Uh, and then it has been the enabler for uh, a lot of new applications and breakthrough in the area of computer vision. But of course, um, there are still um, a part of ongoing research. So there are a lot of, um, I would say, limits and some um, probably uh, fundamental drawbacks that people are trying to address. And these are uh, basically related to um, how we use them and what uh, and what do we need to make deep learning work. So. Obviously, we talk a lot about uh, the need to have uh, a lot of data to be able to train deep learning accurately. And um, we also talked about the compute intensive uh, nature of uh, deep learning and that we need specialized hardware. We've seen in um, the last lecture that they could potentially be influenced by bias in data sets and they are susceptible to adversarial examples. Um, other limitations that they have is um, uh, the uh, how to encode some structure in the network that relates to the data and how to incorporate our prior knowledge during learning. There's also at the moment uh, they are poor at representing uh, uncertainty and how um, they react to some unpredictable input that they have not seen during training. Um, and finally, they are difficult to optimize and they require a lot of uh, knowledge and experience in order to design um, uh, a network architecture. Um, so it's difficult to build um, some uh, complex models, and especially as uh, you know, the requirements and the, and the uh, demands grow even bigger and bigger. Uh, it's it's a lot of effort to design uh, more complex networks. Uh, so in this lecture, we will see basically some attempts to remedy some of these uh, limitations. So uh, we have seen how supervised learning can lead to uh, very good performance with regards to uh, computer vision tasks. Uh, however, this performance uh, usually requires uh, a decent amount, a large amount, I would say, of uh, labeled data. 
but uh, collecting manual labels uh, and, and annotating the images, for example, in the size of ImageNet, which is millions of images, uh, it's hard and uh, it's difficult to scale up, especially for some applications that uh, need more specialized uh, data. So this imposes a huge overhead on human uh, effort and human labor. We need a lot of human annotators to do this job for us. Um, and it, it would be much more effective if we can somehow uh, use all the data that we have available because of the internet and all these sensors that um, are being deployed uh, without having to label uh, every uh, instance of data. So uh, currently deep learning is predicated on uh, having large scale data. So the most successful applications out there uh, rely on uh, mostly supervised learning to achieve uh, very good results. Uh, however, um, such approaches could fail catastrophically if um, the input data is not uh, what they have been trained on. But of course, it's quite infeasible to expect uh, that um, we'll be able to label all possible corner cases in our data set. So, uh, the idea behind this method uh, called self-supervised learning is to leverage all the available data that we have uh, by selecting one aspect of, of the data that could serve as a supervision signal and that the network can predict. So in that way, it can, can learn to uh, find some important data representations. So in this context, both the input and our target labels come from the same data source, which is our input data. And this idea is also called predictive learning, but most, um, uh, most often you will, uh, uh, you will hear the term self-supervised learning. Uh, and in this slide by Jan LeCun, basically we see uh, where we can get this supervision from uh, the existing data that we have. Um, so we can find supervision in the temporal domain or in the spatial domain or both. Uh, and as an example, uh, let's consider that we have some video frames uh, and we could predict, for example, the next frame from the previous frames, either using the whole history or some uh, recent past. We could also predict past frames from the current frames, or we could remove uh, some spatial information from some of the frames and try to recover that. So in general, this idea of self-supervised learning is about hiding some uh, pro component of the data uh, and trying to predict it. And this enables us basically to uh, use even more data um, than before, than supervised learning, because now supervision is embedded within um, our data. Uh, and the idea here is that if a machine is able to predict, then it will gradually uh, become uh, more intelligent. And there's a lot of um, uh, um, motivation for this because this is what um, our brains do all the time. We uh, fill in for example, if we have a blight spot in a retina, our brain learns how to fill that, uh, um, that blind spot. We can, uh, we're able to imagine what uh, um, an occluded image looks like with missing parts. We can infer and uh, recover text or speech by filling in the missing words. Uh, in a more higher conceptual uh, manner, we can um, predict uh, the consequences of our actions, and we can predict uh, how a sequence of actions would lead to a certain result. So this idea of predicting something either from um, the past, present, or future, um, it's quite powerful, and it seems that uh, we can use it for uh, computer vision and machine learning as well. And interestingly, uh, this is again a slide from Jan LeCun that shows um, basically, um, 
it represents the information or the amount of supervision that we can have uh, by a cake. So we have at the uh, very top, uh, the cherry on the cake basically, it's uh, reinforcement learning where the, we have an agent that uh, interacts with the environment. It, at some point in time, it will get some feedback on its actions. So basically, this implies that this agent uh, does a lot of things and only gets uh, some information or some supervision at very specific instances. Then we have supervised learning, which is um, more, uh, which is shown here as the as the icing on the cake, uh, which means that we uh, have now a supervision for every input, but again, it's not enough. And here represents self-supervised learning as basically the uh, rest of the cake. So uh, for all the data that we have, we can get some supervision signal and information about uh, that data. And this, I think, shows that uh, um, the, um, the strength that this approach proposes. And there are a lot of people that believe the path towards uh, uh, artificial intelligence and more intelligent systems goes through uh, self-supervision because uh, this enables a system or a machine learning algorithm to learn by itself about the data. So um, we will see now in some detail how this uh, method works. Now, uh, in self-supervised uh, learning, we basically have um, two tasks. Um, the first task is called the pretext task, and it's uh, where the self-supervision will happen. So it's the task where we get the input and we select some uh, component of it so that it could be predicted. Uh, this is the pretext task. Then we can take that model that has learned something and transfer the knowledge onto our um, actually target task, which is called, called the uh, downstream task. And uh, that is where we're going to evaluate the performance because that is the actual uh, target task that we want to actually use the model for. Uh, and it's a quite similar idea to uh, what we had before with uh, transfer learning. So uh, before we had a model with some weights that we trained on ImageNet, for example, and then we moved that model into uh, object detection. And uh, we basically did some fine tuning on the detection part. The idea is quite similar, but instead of having um, ImageNet with pre-trained weights and uh, some pre uh, images with labels, here we have uh, this uh, pretext task that the network predicts um, some uh, component of the data. So um, a question is, what is what can we use as a pretext task? Now, there is no uh, formal definition for what a pretext is. And, and as we will see, there can be a lot of different varieties. Um, but the idea is that this task should provide the opportunity for the network to learn some characteristics and some structure in the data. And it probably needs to be a task that a human could do so that we have some intuition as to uh, what the network would learn by doing that task. So if we look at the different uh, types of tasks, um, they could uh, basically make the let network learn some aspect of, uh, for example, ordering in terms of uh, time or space maybe recover some shape of objects, color, and um, possibly uh, how an object is composed of uh, different subparts, and a lot of other different uh, techniques. So here you see some uh, popular examples. Um, some that are really um, popular are uh, image colorization, uh, ro uh, rotation of images, so predicting uh, how an image is rotated, 
autoencoding that we saw in the last uh, lecture is also uh, a form of a pretext task. Uh, frame prediction is another one. And uh, there are a lot of, of uh, more tasks. And um, for example, image generation could be, uh, that was also in the previous lecture, could also be a form of uh, a pretext task. So ideally, a pretext task should be something that would require the model to learn uh, meaningful features from the data. Uh, and it should be chosen uh, sensibly so that we uh, don't have unrealistic expectations on what the model can learn or, or, or what we expect the model to learn. Um, so for example, autoencoding could be a form of pretext task, but uh, it requires not just generating uh, the original image content, but it could be also uh, influenced by some noise in the image to regenerate the noise as well. So um, in other words, we have to be a bit thoughtful on what actually we use as um, a pretext task. Now uh, let's look at some specific examples. So colorization is a really cheap way of applying self-supervision. Since mostly the images we have are um, in RGB color space, so we could uh, find the grayscale image of that Im uh, RGB image, which involves taking the average of the three colors. And uh, that will give us our input. And as output, we can have the um, RGB image. Of course, there are some technicalities. So for example, uh, in this work, uh, they used uh, some quantized color space so that the network does not predict a continuous range of color, but it chooses um, from uh, uh, some predetermined values of color. And of course, it might also make sense to try a different color space that can be easily encoded uh, by a, a network. But uh, you can imagine, for example, that learning that the um, uh, skin color of a human face is uh, this particular pattern could then enable the network in a detection task to detect faces easier. So you can see the idea behind, um, behind pretext tasks. Another um, uh, re relatively cheap way of doing self supervision is uh, by this idea of uh, in painting with what, uh, context encoders. So in this task, um, the network learns to fill in uh, um, areas that we blank out of the image that we essentially remove from the image. So the idea is that we give an image with some removed um, portions and the network needs to recover what is the content of, um, of the blanked out uh, uh, regions. So in this type of uh, networks, we use usually the uh, L2 loss to compare um, the result of the network with the ground truth missing area to give us an understanding of uh, how the well, uh, how the network uh, does in terms of prediction. So uh, in this particular work, there's also been some improvements in terms of um, types of convolutions. Uh, so in this work, they proposed uh, type of uh, convolution called partial convolution that helps in uh, filling these uh, types of uh, holes. And also um, there could be um, the need to apply some post-processing to make uh, the images uh, better and reduce uh, some artifacts. Uh, and there's also some um, uh, different ways of doing this, uh, this removal of so uh, you could choose to remove random rectangles from the image, or you could basically uh, uh, apply some uh, lights to simulate scratching. Uh, and this same idea is also applied for um, restoration of images. So it's not just a, a pretext task. Uh, another pretext task that's mostly 
suited for video applications is to determine uh, the correct sequence of frames uh, in a video. So in this example, we have uh, a mix, um, some four frames that we mix their orders and the network then has to um, predict the correct ordering of these frames. So to do that, the network needs to uh, uh, associate uh, this temporal motion between frames and uh, basically it allows it to learn how things move uh, in, in a video. Uh, and it's a pretext task that has been used for this reason exactly uh, for uh, action recognition, for example, or other uh, video applications. Now, uh, let's focus a bit more on uh, a rather more um, nuanced uh, pretext task, a rather more advanced pretext task, which is predicting the relative position between two random patches uh, in an image. To do this, a model needs to understand uh, the spatial context of objects and um, what um, subcomponents make an object. So the idea behind this is that we start off with uh, by first randomly sampling uh, one patch from the image without having any reference to the image content. And then uh, we place this patch in a uh, the center of a three by three grid. And then we sample uh, another patch from this uh, grid that is basically in one of these eight uh, locations. What the model then needs to do is to predict to which of the uh, eight regions uh, this part, the second patch belongs to. So, uh, you can cast this as a classification problem that the network needs to classify the second patch in one of eight categories, which represent uh, the number basically of the position of the second patch. Um, uh, some other improvements that people have done in this aspect is to, um, uh, instead of having these patches being completely next to each other, they add some gaps between the patches. Uh, and uh, they could add some jitter to the location, so they uh, could uh, uh, basically randomize a bit the location of the patches, so they don't fall exactly at the same um, at the same position. And they also randomly downsample and then upsample these patches so that they um, reduce um, some noise and avoid pixelation. So the idea here is that. Uh, if you don't know, for example, in this case, what the bus is, then it's difficult to say, okay, this uh, image is uh, on the left or the right or up or top or bottom of the, you know, of the first patch. So um, it's um, the assumption here is that the network will learn that, okay, a bus uh, has this, across all images, has this specific structure and uh, it will uh, learn this, um, representation of a bus and the components of a bus so that it could be able to uh, assign the correct location to the second patch. So given an unlabeled image, remember this is an unlabeled image. It doesn't contain, uh, we don't have any other information for the image. We start by uh, randomly selecting a patch then we have these uh, random possible locations around that patch. And uh, then we select uh, one patch. And uh, what we do next is pass both patches through the same uh, neural network. Uh, and the idea here is that the network will learn features that correspond to all these patches. So at the end, of the network, what we get is uh, an embedding. So uh, in order to solve this task, the network uh, will at some point learn that, uh, okay, this specific patch, this specific uh, semantics, uh, for example, need to um, be embedded on the same uh, feature vector or a similar feature vector. 
And uh, what this, this will do is um, give you a common representation, for example, for the cut. Then you have another common representation for another um, for another um, type of animal or object. Um, and by doing this association, it will start to build some um, uh, meaningful features. So here in this example, uh, we see that uh, if we get, for example, the feature vector produced by the input, and then uh, we try and do a nearest neighbor to what other images are, are near that feature, then you get uh, similar images. So uh, this pretext task basically makes the network predict uh, some um, uh, embedding, some features that have an underlying meaning, basically. And the actual network uh, is uh, basically a series of uh, convolutions and pooling. And uh, these, remember, is the same network. So um, uh, it creates embeddings for the two different patches. And then we use some fully connected networks to predict uh, the location uh, of the image in, in one of the eight positions. Now, the reason, remember, that we are doing this is to make the network predict uh, or learn some um, uh, useful features. And we want to do this in place of having to train um, a network on ImageNet, for example, which will take, um, it may take a lot of time. So if we, so they compare the features or the, uh, the patches, image patches that activate specific neurons. And what they found is that uh, you get similar representation. So uh, a neuron that is uh, trained on ImageNet and is activated by uh, wheels or, or motorbikes, for example, uh, there is also a similar neuron in uh, the other approach. So the end goal here is to learn the same representations without, without having to uh, pre-train on ImageNet. And this is an example that um, we managed to achieve this. Now, uh, once we have this model from the pre-trained, uh, from the pretext, uh, task, then we have to uh, fine tune it on the uh, downstream task. Uh, at this point, um, it, we have the same um, setting as with the traditional transfer learning. So we could um, uh, use those weights and, and freeze the network, or we could uh, basically fine tune it with a smaller learning rate uh, in order to um, perform the downstream task. And then we evaluate the performance uh, based on what the downstream task is and the metrics that the downstream task uh, has. So overall, the, the effort in self-supervised uh, research is to um, identify good pretext tasks that will help neural networks learn um, by using less label data. Uh, in other words, the idea here is to identify uh, useful representations uh, from unlabeled data through a more supervised method. Uh, and this will produce, uh, will lead to a lot of improvements in terms of uh, not having to annotate data sets and not depending so much on the human effort um, uh, to build machine learning uh, models. So uh, we'll now move to a um, different subject. Uh, so we have seen um, uh, how a convolution on your networks, the structure of the convolution fits uh, really well with uh, uh, with images because of the features and the fact that um, these features could be repeated and, and we may need to detect them at different um, at different areas of the image. Uh, and we've seen that one way to gain some invariance to uh, the sizes of objects and uh, the position of the features is to do this uh, pooling or strided convolution so that we gradually re reduce 
the amount of uh, the size of the feature maps, the spatial resolution of the feature maps. Now, uh, in a neural network, in a convolutional neural network, uh, the way it's built, it's good at detecting features, but uh, spatial, spatial uh, relationships are not of great importance for a CNN. So the relative position or orientation or size of a feature does not matter so much for a convolutional neural network. Uh, and this is because exactly it, about, um, uh, of this pooling operation that basically creates this positional invariance, but at the same time, it contributes to losing um, spatial information. And this exactly prompted uh, Geoffrey Hinton, who is touted as one of the fathers of deep learning, to say that the pooling operation used in convolutional neural networks is a big mistake, and the fact that it works is uh, so that it works so well is a disaster. And what he means by this is that um, uh, we're throwing away so much information through pooling uh, that it does not make sense. But because in practice it works so well, it's difficult to stop doing it. And this prompted uh, him and his team to start thinking about uh, other ways of, um, um, of building CNNs. And this is what we're going to see uh, in this part of the lecture. So let's focus a bit now on the um, problems with uh, CNNs. So pooling layers reduce the spatial resolutions. Um, um, so that the outputs are invariant to small change to the inputs. This means that we, if we want to build uh, like a face classifier, what the CNN does, it basically uh, uh, tries to find whether uh, the Im image contains an eye or a nose or a mouth. And if it finds these uh, with enough high probability, it will say that uh, there is a face in the image. It doesn't give a lot of um, weight on the fact that how symmetrical the face should be or the spatial position of the of the face. So if you look on the right, you can see that this pooling operation uh, could lead to the same uh, feature representation from two different images that may not represent the same thing. And this is basically uh, what Hinton was saying that uh, pooling works, but uh it's uh it's it's not so a good a good thing that it works so well because it may lead to uh false positives and neural networks losing the sense of structure in the data uh, a second problem is that uh, neural networks have a lot of neurons and each one tries to learn a different aspect uh, of the object so if the viewpoint of the object changes so here for example if we flip uh, the ship, the network will not be able to recognize it because in the training, it hasn't seen an upside down ship. Uh, what the problem is here is that it has learned to associate some features with the ship, but not associate these features together. So alternatively, what we want to do is say, okay, this uh, boat, this uh, ship is represented by uh, some particular shapes, and the network should recognize that, okay, I found these same shapes, but at different orientations. So probably it's still a ship, but with a different uh, structure. Uh, and then through, this, um, through these problems, uh, they came up with this idea of uh, capsule networks. Uh, and they published a few papers on this, and in fact, Hinton was uh, working on this um, a few years before he published actually this uh, these papers, uh, and the main idea um, came from um, computer graphics, where in graphics we have some um, uh, small objects, some for example uh, rectangles and triangles, and what we uh, this is a three D representation, so we also have some properties. And we combine this so we get uh, to an image. Now, cap capsule networks, the idea behind capsule networks is that uh, we can do this in reverse. So we have the image, and 
we find the um, uh, the components that the object is made of, then we can identify uh, the object and its uh, state. So the essentially capsule networks exploit the fact that uh, as we change the viewpoint of an object, um, then we can still recognize the object because the main um, um, subcomponents of the object are, are still there. So uh, in the example there with the Statue of Liberty, you can see that uh, I'm pretty sure maybe no one has seen this statue in this particular viewpoint, but because we, you know uh, how the statue is represented and what are the main building blocks, you are able to recognize it even if the pixel values are quite uh, different. And the way that uh, the capsule networks uh, do this is through uh, what uh, they call a capsule. Uh, so a capsule network is composed of many capsules, and the capsule essentially is a group of neurons that learns to detect a particular object uh, for a given region in an image, and um, it does not only predict whether a component or an object is there, but also it learns some, um, as we call them, instantiation parameters of the, of the ob object, so some properties of the object, and how uh, these properties change. So a capsule outputs a vector uh, whose length estimates the probability that an object is present and uh, uh, the uh, orientation of that vector could, uh, for example, encode uh, another object uh, property. And we can have um, different types of capsules. At the lowest layer, uh, we call this, um, these capsules the primary capsules, and at the higher layer, we, we call them the routing capsules. And uh, the routing capsules detect uh, the uh, compositionality of objects and more complex uh, relationships between the, um, the uh, parts of objects. So in essence, um, capsule networks are similar to normal neural networks. They are organized in layers. And you start by applying a few layers of convolutions to, to, to turn uh, image, uh, images into some features. So you get a feature map. Uh, and then you can start applying these capsule layers. And these capsule layers, what they give you is at each position, uh, they detect the present of an object. So in this case, we have um, uh, one capsule for each of triangle and rectangle. Uh, and uh, the length of the vector at each location indicates whether at that position uh, that particular um, object is present or not. And the orientation of the, um, of the vector gives you uh, some uh, intuition on the rotation of that object. Now here, uh, the orientation is uh, just an example, but it could be any other arbitrary uh, property. And in fact, this is uh, something that is learned through the network. The question then is, how do we take these detectors and um, combine them together to understand what object uh, do we have? Now, the way this works is that at each uh, lower level capsule, so the primary capsule, uh, it does not only predict that uh, there is a, a particular object in its properties, but it kind of predicts what the next uh, capsule layer will, or the state of the object in the next capsule layer. Uh, and this happens through a transformation matrix that we learn. So it's learned through backpropagation and uh, the actual outcomes, when we have the actual outcome from the higher level uh, capsule layer, then uh, we start to see uh, with which lower level capsules the, um, um, there is an agreement with the higher level capsules. And this process is an iterative process. So we could think here as uh, voting in half transform or, or ransack. And um, 
when we when we find the matches between the rousing capsule and the primary capsule, then this creates a link by which we um, apply the backpropagation. So um, here, the the way that we do backpropagation is not fixed as we had with a pooling layer, but we backpropagate uh, with um, this routing agreement in mind. Now to to find the agreement between the routing capsule layer and the primary capsule layer, uh, this is done iteratively. So uh, in the paper, they have um, this iteration to three. So are there um, is uh, three, uh, and this adds, of course, to the uh, computation uh, um, and uh, it creates uh, makes the whole network run much slower than a con uh, convolutional neural network. But the main idea here is uh, that we have these capsule networks that predict the state of the object or uh, uh, and uh, some property, and then at the next level, we find which objects have predicted the correct state of the um, um, for the object, and then uh, we back propagate and forward the results through those. And this is uh, why it's called dynamic routing. It's because these uh, these links and how we get information is computed at run at runtime. It's not fixed as in uh, with pooling. Here you see the uh, architecture of a capsule network. So in the beginning is uh, quite similar to a convolutional neural network. So here we have two convolutional layers with ReLU activations. Uh, and each has, uh, and the first for example, has 256 uh, features. And so does uh, the next layer. And uh, when we reach the second convolutional layer, we start to apply this idea of uh, the capsules. So each, um, each uh, we break this uh, this feature map, this 256 feature map, into um, uh, 32 six by six by eight maps, and each channel in this um, 32 maps now represents a capsule. Now uh, this capsule detect a feature across the whole spatial resolution of that feature map. And uh, we also have the routing capsules that get information from the, um, from the primary capsules so that they can predict and do the uh, classification. Now the actual classification, uh, it happens here by just looking at the um, magnitude of each vector which signals the presence uh, of an object. So on top of this, um, they added another layer that, another bunch of dense layers, basically that they do uh, reconstruction of the image. And they did this so that they could have an additional loss that would encourage or enforce the network to, um, can code um, it's the instantiation parameters uh, of the of the capsules. Here, for example, for each digit, they have 16 uh, dimensional representation, and depending on um, what digit is is uh, is predicted, then they reconstruct that digit with the fully connected uh, networks. So uh, capsule networks are um, a, uh, a recent flavor of convolutional neural networks. There was a lot of interest when uh, Hinton uh, published his paper and for the next one or two years. Uh, but uh, the reason they haven't taken off is because mostly um, they haven't uh, shown uh, the same um, benefits when uh, doing uh, training on large scale data and uh, they're a bit slower, but uh, they have reached good accuracy in terms of uh, evaluating on smaller data sets like NIST, while not so much on uh, CIFAR 10, for example, even though the accuracy is promising. Uh, overall, they require less training data 
And the fact that they encode this position and pose information could be helpful for uh, segmentation or detection tasks, even though uh, there is not much effort, at least in the same uh, way that there is for convolutional neural networks. Uh, capsules uh, provide the way of uh, interpreting what the activations do, so it's nice to have some interpretability. Uh, and they offer robustness to affine transformations. Uh, but as I said, still it's a bit um, unproven on uh, some data sets. And uh, uh, of course, people are also trying to improve uh, this aspect. And perhaps the most, uh, um, the major drawback is that they are much slower during training because of this uh, routing by agreement algorithm that requires taking a lot of passes uh, iteratively for uh, for the capsule. So that was for just a small network. Imagine how much slower they will be for larger resolution images. And of course, this is one open area of research uh, that people are exploring. Now we talked here about the structure of, of CNNs and how capsules help to encode uh, different uh, different structures and, and learn other properties of objects. Uh, but if we look at the general way that we use these networks, um, uh, we give them an image and, for example, a cat or a dog, and you could have a capsule network, you could have a convolutional neural network, and each of these they will give you a prediction of uh, having a cat or a dog uh, in the image. So um, what happens, however, if we put some uh, image that it's not a cat nor a dog? For example, we could give it an um, image of a horse. Now, the way the problem is set up is still, the network is going to still output a probability for a dog or a cat because these probabilities have to sum to one. Um, so here there's, there's clearly something missing between um, having a prediction of the network and how confident or is the network on its prediction? Because clearly this is not a cat or a dog, uh, but there's no way of the network letting us know that, okay, I haven't seen this image before, or I don't know basically what is in this image. Uh, so here, what I'm emphasizing is that the probability is not actually a metric of confidence. So in this case, we could, it could be desirable to have a network give us an indication of, you know, uh, I'm giving you a high prediction, but I'm not confident in that prediction. So we could then uh, try and figure out what's going wrong. And one possible way to accomplish this is through Bayesian uh, deep learning. And this is a really new and emerging field. So to understand this, let's first go through our base learning problem. We're given some data X and we are trying to learn an output Y by learning this function F that is parameterized by uh, this set of weights W. So in a Bayesian network, rather than learning the weights, uh, the neural network approximates a probability distribution over the weights given the label Y and X. So Bayesian networks uh, are considered Bayesian because exactly they, we can rewrite this posterior through the base rule. However, thing, this is um, uh, difficult to compute and intractable. So uh, what people have proposed is uh, to use different ways to approximate this basically um, using uh, uh, sampling operations. One such example uh, of how to use sampling is through this concept of dropout. So if you recall, uh, dropout is a method to regularize networks during training by setting uh, particular um, uh, elements in the activation to zero. So here, basically, instead of setting the activation to zero, dropout is used uh, to uh, make zero to turn to zero some of the weights in the network. 
Uh, and the idea here is that we uh, perform different passes through the network. And each time uh, we make a pass, we first um, uh, drop out some, uh, some of the weights by applying uh, this dropout filter. And uh, we get the result uh, at the other end. So in this way, we generate uh, new filters by using the dropout. And it's like basically sampling from a distribution of weights. So if we do this t times, uh, we are going to obtain different predictions every time, of course. But if we look at the mean value of the variance of those predictions, we can get a sense of how uncertain uh, the model is. Uh, and one practical application here is in the context of depth estimation from uh, single images. Um, so recall that the goal here is to uh, train a, a network to predict the depth of each pixel in that image. Uh, and we can add to this, augment this with uncertainty that is associated with every prediction. So for every pixel, we don't only say uh, the probability of a depth or the depth, but we also, uh, the network also predicts some form of uncertainty. So with dropout weights in the network, uh, we pass um, the image many times, a number of times, and we measure then able to measure the uncertainty of the network. And what you, what you can observe if you look at the, the image is that uh, with, um, with blue is a low uncertainty and the uh, other colors show high uncertainty. Uh, it's, uh, we have a high uncertainty at the spots that correspond to the portion of the image that there is overlap between objects. So, for example, overlap between the, the different cars and the, and the boundaries. And this makes sense because in that's the actual the region of that the depth discontinuity is more difficult to predict. So you can see that if we start adding this component of uncertainty, it's really helpful to us to explain why could the network make a mistake or how we can improve it. Uh, to conceptualize this a bit further, this is an example of a model that predicts um, uh, the steering angle for um, uh, for us controlling a self-driving car. So um, our goal here is to predict the steering angles, and uh, in order to estimate a certainty for the steer steer steering uh, prediction model, we pass it through an ensemble of this uh, dropouts and sampled networks. Uh, now, each of these models will have a different set of weights, of course, uh, and it will give you a different set of uh, results. Um, uh, we can aggregate these estimates together, and you can see that they actually form some sort of distribution. And uh, to actually estimate the uncertainty, we can look at the variance of this distribution or, uh, or the mean. But uh, if they are clustered together, then it means that the model is really confident in the predictions. The important thing here is that these, um, these estimates are drawn from underlying distribution. Uh, and what the assembling is trying to do is to sample through that in a distribution. And that is the, the main idea behind these types of networks, of course. One drawback here that you can imagine is that for instead of having a single pass, you have multiple passes for one single image. So some efforts that came after this was to try and approximate this uh, and model this distribution directly using a neural network. Uh, and when, what we're learning in that way is what is called an evidential distribution. And this captures how much evidence the model has in support of a prediction. So how much of the data was used to make um, uh, to make a prediction. And the way we train some such models is that we first try to maximize the fit uh, to the data. Uh, and then we also want to minimize the evidence that the model has in cases where the model makes errors. Um, so if we're to train a regression model, and suppose we have this case here, uh, we're in the white in the white regions, 
the model has data, and in the gray regions, the model has no data. Uh, a deterministic model would basically uh, fit the white region very well, uh, but the gray region would be uh, unpredictable in since it hasn't seen uh, data there. Uh, and what will happen if we train um, using uh, a evidential uh, model is that um, uh, we're going to get uh, um, some form of uh, low confidence in those areas that we don't have data. So looking at how this uh, approach can further be utilized, remember in the last uh, lecture, we talked about adversarial examples and how they can um, change the prediction of the network. So using this form of um, evidential distributions, we can um, make the models robust to adversarial perturbations. Um, so as an um, if an image is changed adversarially, adversarially uh, the estimates of uncertainty will also increase for those regions. Um, so in this example, we see that the depth estimation uh, or the model is uh, the model the input of the model is changed. Um, as it's changed with higher noise, then uh, the uncertainty also changes. And this can give us um, some indication of whether or not the data are valid to to use for prediction. Uh, and uncertainty can also be um, done into different types of tasks beyond regression. So we have, we've seen depth, and it's also viable for um, semantic segmentation. And in fact, people uh, have used uh, this approach to improve the quality of segmentations and depth estimations in areas of uh, higher uncertainty. And uh, it's an approach that it basically gives you feedback on how the model does, and then you can um, decide on the training approach to improve uh, on the uncertain conditions. Now, of course, um, um, doing all these experiments with neural networks is really um, requires a lot of effort and a lot of of oftentimes a lot of manual effort. Uh, so um, a lot of people have started to uh, to see how they could use what is called as automated machine learning. So the idea here is that um, is to go beyond having humans as designers and implementers of your network, but want to reach a point where we can automate the process of finding a good neural network for a given task. And uh, as you hopefully saw in the assignments and through uh, throughout this course, this is ex specifically very important because uh, networks, neural networks require significant effort to be tuned and be optimized for the task of interest. So and this is especially important as models get more and more complex, we get more data and the amount of information and the, the task that we want them to do get even more uh, complicated. So what researchers at Google did, and then uh, a lot of others followed with different approaches, is to train a machine learning model to itself design a machine learning model that was able to solve uh, a given problem. And we call this whole idea automated machine learning or uh, AutoML in short. Now, the way this framework works is by having what is called a controller neural network, which acts as an agent. So it's a reinforce, reinforcement learning um, paradigm. And what the network does, it proposes uh, what is called as a child model architecture um, in terms of uh, some hyperparameters. And then that child network is trained on the target tasks and is evaluated given the metrics of that particular task. Say, for example, it could be uh, image classifications. 
And the performance that the model gets is used as feedback or a reward to the controller. And then the controller agent uses this feedback and again tries to uh, come up with a suitable child network in order to optimize based on that feedback. And this happens across thousands of thousands of iterations. Uh, and over these iterations, it, produce, it produces an architecture that um, uh, it, it trains them and evaluates them until it reaches uh, um, a um, suitable um, performance um, threshold. So as you can imagine, this is a quite uh, computationally intensive process. And uh, there's ad some other approaches that have tried to do this in a much more efficient way. Um, now, specifically, this controller network is a, a recurrent neural network, so it, pro it produces a time series as an output, um, and it considers uh, different types of uh, hyperparameters and values, like, for example, what should the type of the layer be? Um, if it's a convolution layer, it could be the size of the kernel or the number of filters, uh, and so on. And um, if you run this network, you get basically parameters that define another neural network that we then um, use to um, train um, and test its accuracy and evaluate it on the given task. And we give that as a feedback back to, uh, to the controller network to generate another, hopefully better um, child network. And in fact, Google has uh, actually uh, use, uh, promotes this as a service um, if, um, that you can use. It's a cloud service. Um, and you provide it with a data set and some metrics. And it runs this AutoML framework so that it can provide you with some candidate networks that uh, you can then deploy for the task that you're interested in. And, um, use uh, if they are suitable. So uh, the idea here is that we want to uh, significantly reduce the burden that there is on engineers and designers to do all this uh, tuning and uh, exploration of the hyperparameters to find a suitable architecture uh, for, uh, for a neural network. And this actually makes deep learning quite accessible to the public, so you don't have to be an expert to um, uh, to develop a neural network. The, the AutoML framework does it for you. Uh, but of course, running such experiments and even with uh, um, smaller networks, uh, we need suitable hardware infrastructure um, to do that. So I now just want to touch a bit on uh, what is the underlying hardware that we use that enables us to run and train uh, deep learning models. Now we have said that traditionally uh, we use GPUs to train and run deep learning models and in fact um, the concurrent rise of GPU hardware has uh, propelled deep learning to the position it is today just because the computations that are that are done in a deep learning network are well suited for uh, for GPUs. So a GPU is designed for graphics and graphics operate on uh, matrix data and do a lot of matrix operations uh, and a lot of linear algebra. That's why people have started to use uh, GP, uh, GPUs not only for deep learning but for other mathematical modeling. Uh, and it can do that, uh, those matrix operations in parallel compared to a CPU that does uh, fewer things in parallel, but much faster. So if we specifically look at uh, the convolution operation, we can remap that same convolution into exactly uh, a matrix, uh, a matrix matrix uh, multiplication, which is exactly what uh, GPUs are made for. And this is what uh, enables uh, deep learning models to run um, more efficiently. We can go a step further and um, 
do operations for multiple filters um, and multiple channels at the same time, again, by transforming the convolution into a suitable matrix uh, operation. And if you could consider that GPUs have uh, multiple cores, um, this operation can be parallelized really easily. And also considering the uh, type of memory that GPUs have, which is more specialized for parallel access, you can start to see uh, why um, they are a much more suitable platform for uh, deep learning. And looking at some uh, con comparable uh, results, you can see that they provide uh, a huge improvement in terms of um, uh, speed up in terms of uh, uh, throughput and speed. And this is what basically uh, played a big, um, a big fact was a big factor in the adoption of uh, deep learning. And the speed up is also considerable even for smaller and um, uh, bigger networks. So it's uh, transferred across different, all the whole spectrum of uh, deep learning models, basically. So in recent years, we have started to see also hardware that is specifically designed for neural networks. Uh, so you can imagine that this is quite similar to a GPU, but without the specialized components for graphics. This uh, was uh, mostly done by Google that pushed for a custom chip uh, called the TPU. But also NVIDIA has now this uh, dedicated cores in their GPUs uh, that are just for machine learning on their uh, GPUs. And these are the platforms that power the uh, different cloud services that you might use. For example, the Google Colab service is powered by these machines. Uh, but recently we started to see uh, that smaller platforms that are intended more for IoT applications and edge applications have started to make way into the market and they enable the deployment of deep learning um, without the need for any cloud connection. And again, in these platforms, we have uh, special hardware for uh, tensor operations, and they can also work alongside the CPU to accelerate deep learning and computer vision operations. And this is basically a trend that we're seeing of custom chips coming out, specifically tailored for uh, deep learning. Uh, these custom chips can be used uh, because they provide a very good trade-off between uh, power consumption on your phone, for example, and they give you the facility to have a real-time uh, application. Uh, and in fact, uh, such systems are especially developed for autonomous vehicles, like uh, for example, this uh, Drive PX2 from NVIDIA, uh, which does uh, all this deep learning for autonomous driving. Uh, and another company that does uh, deep learning hardware for autonomous vehicles is Mobileye, uh, which uh, is renowned for the vision uh, processor that it has, and it was uh, acquired by Intel in 2017. And uh, we are starting to see AI chips not only as uh, um, um, segments of the market that relate to automotive, but they are now nowadays in our phones. All the major uh, manufacturers of phone processors have some form of, um, uh, or as they are called, a vision processing unit or um, um, tensor processing units. So they use these for uh, for doing things like optimizing your camera image or uh, detecting scenes and adjusting the settings of the camera accordingly or detecting faces or um, to unlock your phone with your face. Uh, and it's, uh, this is just the beginning. We're going to see a lot of development in this, uh, in this area. So today in this lecture, we have touched a bit on some emerging topics in deep learning. We've seen how um, self-supervised is now another form of learning uh, instead of unsupervised or supervised or um, reinforcement learning that takes advantage of the data itself to make um, labels and um, make prediction based on those generated labels. 
We have seen another form of, of uh, convolutional neural networks, the capsule networks, that uh, try to address one of the main issues with the CNN, that is the uh, pooling operations. Uh, then we saw how we could uh, represent uncertainty in a neural network to model uh, what uh, input data the network is not confident about. And then we touched a bit on the attempts to automate the machine learning process and development cycle. And finally, we talked about uh, deep learning hardware uh, that is uh, enabled all this progress in these years and will uh, drive the next generation of uh, applications. So having concluded, I would just want to uh, put everything together in what we have uh, seen in this, in this course. So we tried to cover a lot of material. The emphasis was uh, not only on the more recent advancements, but we also tried to see uh, where things uh, started from and built a uh, bottom-up intuition of computer vision techniques. So we first started to look at how images are formed through uh, the camera lenses and how they are encoded into this 3D matrix form. And then we saw that we could apply some basic filtering to detect features and uh, do some feature extraction. Then we moved on to uh, more advanced techniques uh, like motion detection and optical flow. And finally, how we can uh, use multiple cameras to obtain 3D information uh, and depth perception. And we saw that we could uh, do tracking based on these features and do some clustering to um, gain some more higher uh, level information. Uh, then we saw how to exploit machine learning to uh, use all the data and make computers learn by themselves how to do uh, classification, detection, and segmentation for uh, complex objects and complex scenes. And finally, in the last few lectures, we saw some recent research, um, mainly focusing on deep learning for generative uh, modeling and generating new images uh, for uh, uh, tackling image-to-image -image translation problems. And today we saw uh, how we can uh, use self-supervision as uh, when we don't have a lot of data and, um, and a new flavor, a more recent flavor of networks in the form of uh, capsule networks. So uh, overall, I hope uh, you've learned a lot in this course. We covered a lot of material and there are some things that we did not cover like, uh, for example, attention mechanisms or deep reinforcement learning and control. Um, and uh, what to take from this class, I think, is that computer vision is a continuously evolving field, and it's going to be uh, with us for a long time. And I'm pretty sure you will see uh, a lot of um, new applications enabled by uh, computer vision.